We start by telling you that operatives of Nigeria's Economic and Financial Crimes Commission have reportedly barricaded the house of the immediate past governor of Kogi State, Yahaya Bello, in Buse, Abuja. It was reported that the EFCC siege is coming days after Bello held a meeting with President Bola Tinubu at the State House. Although there was no immediate information available to the reason the anti graft agency stormed the former governor's residence, it may be connected with the alleged 84 billion naira fraud case against him, which the AFCC is prosecuting. The anti graft commission, in an amended charge, accused Bello of diverting 80 billion naira of state funds in September 2015, four months before he assumed office. And now we just, uh, right now, we are showing you live feeds uh, from the Abuja residence of the former governor of uh, Kogi State, Yahaya Bello, where he is said to be uh, under monitoring by the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission. The word we have is that there's a possibility it might be taken away today to answer for the allegation leveled against him. But then you can see um, people gathering around his residence and um, some officials were actually standing by. We also know that there are loyalists who are also there wanting to know what would eventually transpire as a story. And uh, the news has filtered in that the possibility of Yahaya Bello uh, being whisked away or taken away by the EFCC is imminent. We definitely will stay on uh, this particular story to bring you more details as regards it uh, during the course of our news and the rest of the bulletins for today. And now moving on, the Kano State High Court has adjourned the arraignment of the former state governor, Abdullahi Ganduje, and seven others to April 29 to allow the state government to serve the respondents the notice of the charge. The Kano State government is accusing Ganduje of misappropriating public funds during his time as governor, including the purported acceptance of about $413,000 rather and $1.38 billion naira in bribes. At the arraignment, the counsel to the sixth respondents, Lamarche Properties Limited, which is one of the respondents, argued that the case was a criminal matter and hence the prosecuting counsel should serve the notice of charge to all the respondents. The trial judge, Usman Naba, having listened to the counsel's arguments, adjourned the case and directed that they should put all the parties on notice. Our correspondent, Marvelous Obomano, now brings us details. Uh, Marvelous, I believe you can hear me. So I'd like you to just give us an update as regarding this uh, particular issue um, that we have been talking about, most especially as it concerns the former governor of Kano State. Well, um, the inability of the Kano State you know, government to press criminal charges on the APC national chairman, Abdullahi Ganduje, stalled the much anticipated arraignment that is supposed to you know happen today uh, ganduji and seven other uh, parties you know were supposed to be arraigned in court today so at the court the sixth respondent out of the eight respondent is the only respondent you know that made an appearance in court today so he raised an objection that he doesn't want to continue the the, the proceeding today that the prosecution which is the government has not you know filed the notice of the charges on them, on all the respondents, and therefore he urged the trial judge to continue the hearing of the case today. So after the trial judge, Usman Naba, looked at you know, their arguments, he now adjourned the case to 29th of April for continuation of hearing. And of course, you know, some of, one of the um, APC stalwarts that I had a conversation today immediately after the you know, failed arraignment said, that the, a former governor of Kanu State, the person of Rabbi Kwankwaso, that he has an interest in becoming the APC national chairman. And that is why he's trying to use the current governor to witch hunt Ganduja. And of course, you've learned of what is happening in Abuja currently, where uh, personnel of the EFCC, operatives of the EFCC, had besieged you know, the house of the former you know, Kogi State governor whom has been rumored to, you know, eye the APC national uh, APC seat, the national chairman seat. So you look at the former Kogi State Governor Yaya Bele has been rumored 
to want to go for the APC chairman. And at some points, they are saying that Rabbi Kwankwa also has an interest to contest, to join the APC and contest as the national chairman. So when you look at, you know, the two issues, you may want to say that the web is somehow connected. Hmm. Uh, a bit of speculations there are marvelous, I must say. But then, has the prosecuting counsel uh, said anything in response as to why they did not serve the notice of charge to the um, said respondents? And okay, now, the, the sixth respondent said that this is a criminal case and not a civil matter, and therefore that the prosecution ought to, you know, serve the notice of charge to all the respondents. But in his argument, the prosecution said that it is not in the, in the law that for him to file a, mo a, a, motion, a motion to serve the notice on all the respondents. Rather, there is an alternative either to print to send a print of the notice charge using the broadcast or the newspaper to you know, publish those charges and then they can see the charges from there. But then the uh, trial judge said by that 29th, he'll be ruling on that application to say that whether if the argument raised by the prosecution counsel that it is not, he's not obligated to serve that no, the, the notice charge to the respondents, that he has alternative either to use the print media or the broadcast media to send a charge so that they can see from there. So it's about um, probably technical argument, which mm. on the 29th, the trial judge will be delivering, uh, you know, judgment on that application, motion application raised by the sixth respondent. Well, of course, we understand Based that. The, you know, excuse given. Uh, definitely, we understand that um, the constitution of the law is clear when it comes to protocols as regards what is to be filed and in what manner it should be. But then quickly, um, let's uh, take your reaction as regards probably what um, the uh, former uh, governor of Kano has said as Abdullahi Gandhi J. if he has responded to any of these allegations and uh, the permutation or the political speculation that he said that um, the current governor of Kano is interested in this particular case because of his political ambition. Has he responded to this? He hasn't responded yet, although uh, they are yet to serve the criminal charges. You know, they are yet to serve that criminal charges. The government of Kanu State is yet to serve the notice of those charges to him. So that is why none, both him, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the seventh, and the eighth respondents didn't make any appearance, only the six respondents. So once the prosecution, which is the government, serves the notice of the charges to all the respondents, then he can al be allowed to make comments, either directly or through his you know, uh, uh, representative counsel. Okay, uh, Marvelous Bumana, thank you so much. This is one case that I believe that we'll continue to keep our eyes on, and we hope that we'll get enough details. Our eyes are on the 29th of April to see what the trial judge will eventually rule uh, in terms of this particular um, case. Thank you so much. Okay. Moving on with the rest of the stories now. In the war against uh, money laundering, terrorism, financing, and other financial crimes in Nigeria, anti-corruption experts say adequate information relating to beneficial ownership of assets is crucial to ending public service corruption. This was during a training session organized by Nigeria's Financial Intelligence Unit in partnership with the Rule of Law Coalition aimed at building the capacity of law enforcement personnel in using available information to tackle graft. Joshua Imarai tells us more. According to the latest Transparency International Corruption Perception Index, Nigeria scored 145 out of 180 countries ranked. While many say this reflects the sorry state of corruption in the country, they agree there is a need to tackle this monster headlong. Some anti-corruption experts converge on Abuja, Nigeria's capital to train personnel from anti-graph agencies on how to utilize beneficial ownership information to combat corruption. We cannot have a comprehensive BO. For real, it's not going to happen. Already I know that uh, FRS have won, that they already have, METI has. So this BO that we're talking about, yes, the company registry is hosting that very large uh, BO data that we're looking out for, but there will be pockets of them here and there. So what I want to put on the table before you go into the serious business you are here for is to say that start thinking of how these data 
we talk to each other. They say the information now collated in the registry will help on the beneficiaries of wild-scale corruption. It may not necessarily be a magic wand that causes all the anti-corruption issues in the country to go away, but it is a very critical step because if we are able to lift the veil, if we are able to you know, go beyond the facade of who has committed the crime, the organization that seems to be behind the crime, to get to the actual personnel, the actual person who benefits from the crime, then we are a step closer to nipping those crimes in the board. While experts have lauded the effectiveness of utilizing beneficial ownership information, law enforcement agencies from Nigeria say its effectiveness and efficacy in prosecuting perpetrators of various financial crimes have been tremendous. The Corporate Affairs Commission, which is the primary agency that is responsible for the registration of all you know, legal entities of Nigeria, has granted us an, 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 an online access. So it means we can stay in our office and have access to their data, you know, which has been a game changer for us. It has helped us a lot in identifying the people that are behind you know, some of this uh, uh, trafficking. As Nigeria continues its efforts in the fight against corruption, this collaboration and training initiative underscores the visible commitment to transparency and accountability. In Abuja for New Central, I am Joshua Imarai. Earlier on the news, we told you that operatives of Nigeria's Economic Financial Crimes Commission have barricaded at the house of the immediate past governor of Kogi State, Yahaya Bello. And as we know it, um, the operatives of the EFCC are right there at the Buse um, residence in Abuja of this former um, governor of Kogi State. And they are not retreating. And we understand that um, Yahaya Bello is right inside the house. Um, of course, uh, in his house and is currently being joined by the current governor of Kogi State, that is Governor Ahmed Usman Ododo. And um, we have it on authority that um, the operatives are right there and I'm hoping that um, when they're given the go, they will have the opportunity to step into the premises and try as much as possible to extract the former um, state governor of Kogi State from his residence. And according to what we know, um, we do not have a concrete reason why this is happening. But then a lot of people are saying that it might not be unconnected with the fraud allegation leveled against him to the tune of 84 billion naira. And it's been said that at this point, there's a need for him to come and answer or give clarity to this particular allegation leveled against him. So we will continue to stay on this matter even as we know that our correspondent is right there on ground monitoring the situation. The FCC operatives are also there. And um, of course, we have loyalists and other concerned citizens, including other um, operatives from other agencies who are also monitoring the situation, hoping that we can all get a brief of what will eventually pan out um, as we continue to monitor the situation. Moving on now, from Kano State and, um, of course, uh, Kogi State, we now lead you to Lagos, where the Federal High Court in Lagos State on Wednesday granted a businessman and socialite, Pascal Okechuku, popularly known as Kubana Chief Priest, 10 million naira bill with two sureties in like sum. Earlier, the celebrity barman pleaded not guilty to tampering and abusing the naira during his trial. Kubana chief priest was arraigned before Justice Kane de Ogundari on three counts bordering on abuse of Naira uh, by allegedly spraying and tampering with the nation's currency at a social event, contrary to the provisions of the Central Bank Act 2007. It was alleged to have sprayed the Naira on February 13, uh, 2024, at a hotel in Lagos. There is more to come here. We are on New Central now. Do stay with us. We'll be back after this break. Many thanks for staying with us. We now tell you that election stakeholders in Nigeria have called for far-reaching reforms in the nation's electoral process in order to improve and build the confidence of citizens. They called for the amendment of the Electoral Act, expressing worry that it has been unable to compel candidates from political parties to play by the rules. Idon Joseph reports. A national multi-stakeholders forum convened to provide stakeholders with the opportunity to recommend areas 
needed for electoral reforms. Inspired by controversies that trailed the 2023 general end of cycle elections, especially surrounding the use of technology in voting and transmission of election results, they said there are visible gaps in the nation's electoral acts. The quote unquote glitch is that Nigerians head off on election day remains a major drawback as far as the 2023 election is concerned. I know when we have logistic problem before the ballot papers, the necessary tools to get to the electorate members, they feel super bit tired that we are this thing coming from. And it's actually giving them a doubt of what is going on. Some school of thought believe that the election happens to be the best uh, so far. And some believe that, no, we can do better. Uh, but whether we can do better, whether that has been the best, there is one underlying factor that everybody agrees on. There is a need to have a reform. Stakeholders here suggest areas of the act which they think need amendments to improve Nigeria's electoral process. We cannot be using by bimodal system of accepting the results. It is not possible. We can't use the bimodal system of taking the results manually and taking the result by electronic transmission. It is either we go by manual that we know it's going to favor us or we go with the transmission itself. So the law should be straightforward in that aspect. There has to be a clear definition of how our laws are interpreted. It's still not very clear how our laws are interpreted. For example, the interpretation of 25% of votes at least in two thirds of the 36 states. The consensus amongst stakeholders here is that there are gaps in the nation's electoral act that need amendments. They say that they hope recommendations drawn from the meeting will be adopted by relevant stakeholders to further improve the nation's electoral process. In Abuja for New Central, I am Idonk Joseph. Now, while conversations concerning the construction of the Lagos to Calabar Coastal Road are still ongoing, workers of the popular landmark beach resort woke up today to see sand filling work has started on the premises. Landmark is one of the many facilities which will be affected by the coastal road should it continue as planned. Earlier, our correspondent Bernard Akede joined us live for the beach resort story. We're presently live at Landmark Beach Resort at the moment. Uh, for those who know the beach, um, you know that it's just beyond a beach. It's, it's grown uh, in the past few years beyond just a beach resort. resort. Um, behind me is the entire part of, it's part of the beach, and these people here are not exactly beach goers. These are people who work in the various um, vendor stands on the beach. Now, to my left here, I'll swing with the camera so you can see. There's a banner here um, saying, hashtag, save landmark beach, save our beach. And of course, this is part of the ongoing story about um, the coastal road that's been constructed from Lagos to Calabar. It's been in the news for quite a while. Now, this road um, apparently is going to cut through landmark beach. We understand that conversations are still ongoing um, concerning what should be done, whether or not uh, the road will cut or should cut through the beach, whether or not it was meant to go through the beach at, at the very beginning. right? But now uh, the workers here say that just overnight um, they found out that um, heavy equipment, as you can see from far away, and we'll zoom in there in a bit, heavy equipment arrived in the early hours of this morning um, at about 3 a.m. or even earlier and began to sand fill the front part of the beach. As you can see, all that part, the water at the front there is all gone already. The Bola Tinumbu administration has been urged to turn the lives of Nigerians around for the better. The call came from residents of Jaws, the Plateau state capital north central nigeria as the effects of the economic crisis continue to bite chizoba anyanwe was on the street of jaws to feel the pulse of a cross-section of the people and now completes the reports life in nigeria hasn't been such a beautiful one but since the past one year culminating into the administration of president bola tinubu same life of nigerians has not been the same for many indigents and residents on the plateau, when the rich gets richer, the poor continues to wallow in their poverty. With this current hardship witnessed by many Nigerians in the various aspects of life, there are fears and worries how the masses cope with every new day. Farmers are unable 
to go to their farms because of insecurity. But what baffles me most is the fact that even the attackers themselves must feed. So they need to think twice. People barely eat. People hardly go to um, work. People hardly survive because a lot of things are happening. And uh, as a result, a lot of things uh, are coming up, like kidnapping, um, stealing, uh, crisis and the rest of them. The issue of security have crumpled every of our activities. It have rendered our activities useless. Bordering to school, to farming, to health, whatever, social activities, nothing is going well for us because of the insecurity. Clueless and almost hopeless how things will change if there will ever be a change for the better. Nigerians call on government for urgent actions that will positively impact the country. We want the government to look into the issue of insecurity and address it. Once it is addressed, I think the issue of lack of food, economic hardship and any other thing will be taken care of. The government must come in, must, must provide leadership in this area deliberately so that there is harmony and so that our farmers can go back to the farmland. Uh, there are a lot of things that are in the pipeline, poultry, pigry and uh, farming that the government is trying to um, embark on in no distance time across the state. While these words are believed to have been laid on the table of government, attention shifts to see how this change will take a turn to reverse the hardship currently faced by citizens. In Jaws for New Central, Chizoba and Yungwe. Away from that, about 32 states in Nigeria have been earmarked as high-risk flood-prone areas. This was as the Nigeria Hydrological Services Agency released a 2024 annual flood outlook, where they called for effective measures to mitigate the expected effects of flooding on citizens. Amadin Uyi reports. Flooding has in recent times had devastating effects in Nigeria. Experts say the 2022 floods comes to mind as the nation suffered heavy losses in billions of dollars. Flooding has become a perennial incident in Nigeria with attendant impacts such as loss of lives, destruction of properties, displacement and loss of livelihood among others. The total economic damage to residential and non-residential buildings, infrastructure, product, productive sector, and farmlands from the 2022 floods was estimated at 6.68 billion US dollars by the World Bank Global Rapid Pulse Disaster Management Damage Estimation Assessment. As stakeholders converge on Nigeria's capital Abuja, for the 2024 annual flood outlook, they say 32 states, including almost 150 local government areas, have been earmarked to fall under high-risk flood-prone areas and experience flooding this year. The level of floods in this category is expected to be high in terms of impact on the population, agriculture, livelihoods, livestock and infrastructure, and the environment. Part of 72 local government across the country fall within the high flow risk areas in the months of April, May, and June. While part of 135 local government areas in the months of July, August, and September, and part of 44 local government areas in the months of October and November 2024 are within the high flood risk zones. We must increase very strategically and responsibly water harvesting technologies so that rather than have flooding, let people have water stored for them to be able to do dry season farming or irrigation farming. They are calling on state governments to prepare beforehand so as to be able to mitigate the effects on citizens. In Abuja for New Central, I am Amadine Uyi. The news. 
UN Human Rights Chief Volker Turk meets IDPs in DR Congo. Details of this and other stories to come your way shortly. To stay with us. Many thanks for being there. Now, the Zambian government has stopped the issuance of cord boot permits for charcoal production in an effort to control the rampant deforestation happening in the country. According to the Minister of Green Economy and Environment, Collins Nzovu, the decision will initially affect three districts where charcoal production is rampant in the central and southern provinces before spreading to other parts of the country. Zambia is expecting a drought due to poor rains and a massive cutting down of trees over the years, contributing to severe droughts. To discuss this, I'm being joined by a climate change expert and an executive director, Africa Voluntary Carbon Credits Markets Forum, Angliston Tambani Sibanda. Thank you so much for joining us on the news. Can you please unmute your device so I can hear you? Hello, Angliston, can you hear much. me? Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure okay. to, um, to be with you. All right, good. We can hear you too now. Uh, how significant is the impact and the role of charcoal production when we talk about its contribution to deforestation, carbon emissions, and overall climate change? Charcoal plays a big role, um, not only in, uh, em in, in, in increasing emissions, uh, but it's also fueling deforestation. And I think the Zambian government is, has taken um, a very, it's actually a positive step that the Zambian government has taken. Notwithstanding the fact that uh, from a climate change mitigation expert point of view, charcoal also plays a role in terms of uh, 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 regenerative agriculture and, 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 and soil management. So I think it's a question of, uh, managing uh, the, the balance. Remember, there is also a challenge of energy, um, which is affecting these communities that are having to rely, have to have had to rely on, on coal. So hence, it is very important for uh, to have an investment into the just energy transition to ensure that while we are burning charcoal, we also plant trees, but we also make sure that communities have alternative sources of energy. So that balance is actually very critical, which is why the same thing that's going to affect our transition away from fossil fuels um, in Africa. We're going to experience a similar problem where we are tra the, we, there is a need to manage our environment, but at the same time, we, we still have communities that are dependent on charcoal. Uh, you just mentioned um, the fact that um, you are throwing your weight behind what the Zambian government is doing and um, what should be done um, in substitutes for the ban. But then I'd like you to speak further on the potential short-term and long-term effects now of the ban on charcoal production permits, uh, most especially as it affects the producers, um, the market itself, and um, the environment as a whole. Yeah, it's a, it's a whole lot of, 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 of issues. It brings with it uh, uh, issues of sustainable livelihoods. We have communities that have uh, been uh, dependent on charcoal production that whose livelihoods are now being affected all of a sudden. We also have uh, uh, communities that have been dependent on charcoal for energy now that they've got to find alternative sources of energy. And uh, this... Oh, dear me, I think we just lost connection with um, Angliston right there. But um, hopefully, maybe he can rejoin um, us on the news to talk more about this, if possibly we can accommodate him. Moving on now, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, has paid a visit to camps for internally displaced persons in the northeast of the Democratic Republic of Congo. During his three-day visits, Volker would have a series of meetings with the, human rights the, defenders. The, 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 the impact and civil society organizations, as well as with President Felix Shisekedi and members of the government. Between 10 and 15 civilians were killed in weekend attacks in the Beni region in the eastern DRC. 
in new attacks blamed on ADF rebels affiliated with Islamic State. Last Friday, it was reported that 14 civilians were killed in several places in the neighborhood and a new attack targeted another on the night of Saturday to Sunday, leaving two more people dead. With a group of people who had been displaced as a result of horrible violence, massacres were committed in their homes, and they have been here for the last four years. Their most fervent wish is to go, be able to go back. And now in the north of the continent, the United Nations Special Envoy for Libya our standard is resignation, saying the world body could not successfully support the North African country's political transition as its leaders had put their own interests above finding a solution. Senegalese diplomat Abdullahi Abatili made this known while speaking with journalists. He said, under the circumstances, there is no way the UN can operate successfully. Yes, I did tender my resignation to the Secretary General and uh, explain for these very reasons. And uh, of course, it's up to the Secretary General to draw the conclusions therefrom. We have seen in recent months the development of parallel initiatives, which have the objective, even if it is not declared to disrupt the UN-led process. As I, it's very sad, but uh, to, to note, as I said, in Libya today, the bulk of the Libyan population want to get out of this mess. They came to me and asked for a formula which will go beyond those leaders who do not want to put an end to the crisis of the country. Still ahead on the news. Airport diverts flights as floods hit Dubai. Details of this will come your way in a short while. Dubai's major international airport diverted scores of incoming flights as heavy rain slashed the United Arab Emirates, causing widespread flooding around the desert country. The world's busiest air hub for international passengers confirmed a halt to arrivals at 7.26 p.m. local time before announcing the gradual resumption more than two hours later. Earlier, the airport, which had been expecting more than 100 flight arrivals on Tuesday evening, took the equally unusual step of briefly halting its operations in the chaos caused by the storm. Dubai airport operations were suspended for 25 minutes in the afternoon before resuming. Unconfirmed images on social media showed planes taxiing across an apron flooded with standing water. Departure flights remained in operation during the evening but were plagued with delays and cancellations. Access roads to the airports were also badly flooded. And joining us to give us more details on this is our international correspondent, Afia Hagen. Afia, it's nice to have you around. Now, tell us some of the impact that this has had on Dubai. Well, first of all, you mentioned flights there, and flight cancellations are continuing. Uh, from some parts of the United Kingdom, Emirates have cancelled all their flights in and out of Dubai because of that extreme flooding which has hit the airport. But as well as um, flights being cancelled, you also have darkened road, you had lightning flashes taking places over the past couple of days as well. Schools across the seven sheikdoms that make up the United Arab Emirates are closed at the moment. Government officials are working from home and have been told to work from home Tuesday into today, Wednesday. Private companies are also telling their employees to stay at home, to work from home also. Now, there is no information about the overall damage. We know that one 70-year-old man has died when his vehicle was swept away by flood water. 
And it's the heaviest rainfall that Dubai has seen since records began in 1945. A year and a half's worth of rainfall fell in one day. Uh, this is quite unusual to have happened in the United Arab Emirates. But then some people have questioned, uh, of course, this is UAE that, according to what we know, has uh, rain uh, control and management technology. And uh, some experts are saying probably the manipulation of this natural phenomenon is what, and of course, the dredging of the sea to have a Dubai city with all its ecstasy and aesthetic beauty and business is what that has now triggered um, what is happening in Dubai now. Is uh, that a plausible uh, calculation or reason for the flooding that, um, of course, we have seen happened in the country? Well, a lot of people are saying that this is possibly down to cloud seeding. So cloud seeding is a man-made type of climate change, and that's when certain chemicals are put into the atmosphere to make it rain, basically. And Dubai, obviously, in the Arabian Peninsula can get extremely dry. It doesn't really rain occasionally in the colder months, but rain is quite rare. So cloud seeding is used to encourage the rain, basically, uh, and increase rainfall. So it's thought that cloud seeding was used um, over the previous days before this uh, rainfall happened. And so it's thought uh, that heavy Yeah, I think seeding, we just um, lost with audio with you there. Conditions, um, made this, this huge rainfall happen. Okay. So it could have been the man-made climate change along with some rainfall that was already in the clouds came together to make a year and a half's rain fall in one day. So at this time, what role do you think um, the climate change might play in this weather event? And what do you think um, the meteorological agency, I don't know what it's called in um, the UAE, would do to manage the situation so that it does not escalate beyond this? Well, as I answered in my previous question, this was a man-made type of climate change, which is potentially being blamed, and that is cloud seeding. And like I said, that's when certain chemicals are put into the atmosphere to make it rain because the land is quite arable. And like I said, if you had cloud seeding along with existing meteorological effects that meant it was going to rain, then yes, you would have this huge dump of rain that happens over Dubai. Okay, I feel here again. Thank you so much for talking to us. Let's now tell you that Israel faces pressure from its allies to refrain from striking back at Iran for its unprecedented missile and drone attack as Washington and Brussels vowed to ramp up sanctions against the Islamic Republic. British Foreign Secretary David Cameron and his German counterpart Annalena Baerbock were the first Western envoys to visit Israel. Israel and urged calm after Iran's weekend attack, against which Israel has vowed to retaliate. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, after meeting with both foreign ministers in Jerusalem, said Israel will make its own decisions and do what it needs to defend itself. <laughs> בקרוב אני גם משוחח עם מנהיגים נוספים. אני מודה לידידינו על תמיכתם בהגנת ישראל, ואני אומר את זה גם תמיכה במילים וגם תמיכה במעשים. יש להם גם כל מיני הצעות ועצות, אני מעריך את זה, אבל אני רוצה להבהיר שאת ההחלטות שלנו אנחנו נקבל בעצמנו, ומדינת ישראל תעשה כל מה שצריך כדי להגן על עצמה. Talking business now, the Nigerian stock market extended its losing streak for the eighth session with the benchmark index closing 1.93% lower. This marked the largest single-day decline since February 19. The weak performance was driven by selling pressure in telecom giant MTN Nigeria with a minus 1.32% and tier 1 banks GTCO minus 3.66%, including FBNH minus 5.61%. The year-to-date return dropped to 33.48% and the market capitalization decreased by 1.11 trillion naira. Vincent Oshoma, head of capital markets at Interstate Securities, shared insights on the situation during a guest experience on the Business Edge show. 
events in the in the market in the economy in financial in financial system you know that uh, the rates the last meeting cbn increased rates and we have seen rates uptick in rates in the fixed income space so uh, is people exiting the equity market to go into the fixed income space that's why you are seeing this rate and also the recapitalization has also thrown some uncertainty in terms of how we are going to see it pay out because the banks have announced release some of uh, the their plans but we don't know the timing is also something that people are looking at and also when you also look at the latest um, the latest inflation figures that show that we inflation is currently at three percent so and the, with the orkish stance of the cbn i think all these their uh, events is kind of what is impacting our market In sports, Moroccan midfielder Sofian Amrabat has been handed a two-match suspension, which will see him miss his country's next two World Cup qualifiers following the red card received during the Africa Cup of Nations clash against South Africa in January. Officials confirmed on Wednesday Amrabat was sent off after holding back Tebego Mokwena, a decision that was made by the referee only after a VAR review when the two nations met in their round of 16 encounter at San Pedro on January 30. Bokwena went on to score a perfectly struck free kick from the resulting foul, handing Bafana Bafana a shocking 2-0 victory over Morocco, who had entered the tournament as pre-tournament favourites, having reached the semi-finals of the previous World Cup just 13 months earlier. We also tell you that Jude Bellingham has issued a strong call for football authorities particularly in Spain, to take more stringent action against racism following the latest incidents involving his Real Madrid teammates Aurelien Chomeni. The England midfielder's demand comes after Chomeni was sus subjected to racist abuse from a Mallorca supporter after scoring Real Madrid's match last weekend. This disturbing incident is the latest in a series of racist incidents that have plagued Spanish football, with Bellingham's fellow Real Madrid player Vinicius Jr., been a frequent target of offensive chants and gestures from spectators. While condemning the abuse faced by his teammates, Bellingham expressed doubt over whether sufficient measures will be implemented. I would miss players like Vinny if he, if he decided to kind of take a break because of this kind of thing. Um, more needs to be done to support these kind of players and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's sad to hear. And that's all at this hour. But before we go, we take a look at some of our top stories. Court adjourns Gandhi's arraignment to April 29. Zambian government bans charcoal permits in a bid to curb deforestation. Finally, we told you that United Nations Special Envoy to Libya resigns. Do send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number and email on your screen. And you can follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. You can also watch New Central Live on DSTV Channel 422, Star Times Channel 274, Avo TV, and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Lekon Onobanjo.